Today on this episode of The Crossover, we will be discussing dominating the hospitality business with President and Chief Operating Officer of Fountain Blue Development, Philip Goldfarb. Learn how one of the most iconic resorts in the world has not only achieved excellence on every level, but also maintained their position as industry leaders decade after decade. Much more on this episode of The Crossover. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking with Phil Goldfarb, Chief Operating Officer of Fountain Blue Development, talking about how to dominate the hospitality business. They certainly have done that. Hey, Phil, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Amen. Good to see you. Everything all right? Everything's terrific. Uh, well, listen, I'm not going to take up too much of your time. I'm going to do a brief introduction here just while everyone's logging on. Okay. We have the pleasure of speaking with my good friend and role model, as you'll hear, Phil Goldfarb. He is Chief Operating Officer of Fountain Blue Development, where he has really taken that iconic resort to the next level. As CEO, Goldfarb has oversight of the Fountain Blue Miami Beach, JW Marriott, Miami Turnberry Resort and Spa, Hilton, Nashville Downtown, Marriott Courtyard, Boston Downtown, and Fountain Blue Aviation. Phil has over 30 years of experience in the hospitality industry, including seven years as COO of Turnberry Associates and 13 years as Double Trees GM and Director of Operations. Phil is also a distinguished graduate of FIU's School of Hospitality Management, where he currently presides on the school's Industry Advisory Board and held the esteemed position of Chair of the Dean's Council. He was also awarded the university's prestigious FIU Medallion and Torchbearer Award bestowed to outstanding alumni. He was also recognized by the Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce with Excellence in Tourism Award. So delighted to talk today to Phil about dominating the hospitality industry. Very rare for anyone to have not only the success, but just the longevity that he's had. So really excited to talk to you today, Phil. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Let's just uh, get right into it. I mean, how did you first get interested in the hospitality business? You know, I have to tell you, I'm an identical twin. And my twin brother and I became waiters at a very famous Catskill Mountain, upstate New York, giant resort called the Raleigh Hotel. The Raleigh was famous because that's where Dirty Dancing was uh, depicted, the Raleigh Hotel, with uh, the whole craziness of summer lifestyle up in the Catskill Mountains. And, you know, there was a, a president and general manager there by the name of Sid Zalkin. And he used to have, you know, beautiful gray slick back hair and Armani suits. And I said, one day I want to grow up and be like Sid. And sure enough, I, I, I made it. That's awesome. It's good to hear, especially when you know what you want to do at a very early age. You know, everyone sees your success now, but what would you say was the biggest challenge of your career? Well, you know, climbing the ladder is never easy in any um, any industry, but certainly, I mean, I started out as a desk clerk down here, you know, going to FIU School of Hospitality, now the Chaplain School, and uh, it was, you know, just climbing the ladder and getting more and more responsibility. And, you know, I just love the industry and I love the service of taking great care of people and giving them something that an experience they can have for the rest of their lives. So I think that that's in my heart. Um, but then you get into things that you talk about, you know, challenges, you know, whoever expected a COVID uh, experience where you have to shut down and lay off thousands of people and, and worry about their families and their well-being. They still have mortgages and car payments. And so, you know, things like that. And prior to that, they, they had the financial meltdown. So that was a very big challenge. Similar things where we had to cut back and cut back and, and then climb back and climb the runs of the ladder to get out of that. So um, it's taking care of people and worrying about them more so than me. That's such a great perspective. And I think Anyone can do a good job when everything's going well and it's smooth, but can you continue to be successful in hard times? And that's, that's what you've really proven. What would you say is your greatest success? I know it's hard because you've, you've done it for so long and so well, but if you could point to one particular success that, that really stands out, what would it be? Well, you know, I had a 10 year run based out of the Fountain Blue Miami Beach. You know, 1,600 room, a 
amazing, iconic resort. And the fact that I joined Jeff Sofer, the owner of the company, this is my 20th year with Fountain Blue Development, we used to be called Turnberry Associates, um, that I made the decision to join him. I had my own group at the time. Uh, we had small hotels, uh, maybe a dozen of them, uh, and a headhunter grabbed me and talked me into to joining Jeff and, you know, just waking up every day and driving into the iconic Fountain Blue. I ran the hotel group for Jeff out of that hotel, but waking up and walking through there and watching everybody, you know, we did movies there, we've done videos there, we've done every, you know, our giant um, New Year's Eve events where you have 5,000 people with the biggest names from the weekend and Maroon 5 and, and being part of that for a 10 year run was definitely the, the highlight of my career. That's, that's amazing to hear that what would you now everyone again looks at the success but anyone that's been successful will tell you the, that the greatest learning happens during failures what would you say was your your biggest learning moment during your career you know potentially following a, a failure or a difficult time what was the best learning you've had you know it's a good question and I probably still have the same problem and that is you know if somebody isn't right successful not doing a great job i'm always the one to give them a second and third chance and you know find something else for them to do uh within the organization where it probably would be better at times just to make a change so that's probably my weak spot and it's been the that way for a long time i always want to find some some good in everybody how, how do you find that sweet spot then going back to what you say kind of is your biggest weakness giving someone a second chance, but maybe not a third chance. How have you changed the way that you manage now based off what you just said? You no, know, I think being a young general manager and then a vice president and the president of the hotel company, you grow and you learn and you learn from your mistakes. And I look back and say, oh, I should have just cut the cord earlier on. This person is just not a great fit for hospitality. And, um, you know, we have so many career paths and opportunities. I always think there's a place for everybody with under our umbrella. So, uh, but I've learned over the years, there are times now I'm probably not as soft as I used to be. I hear you. I hear you. You know, let's get into what makes the Fountain Blue so unique. I mean, Miami Beach has so many resorts. People have so many options of where to go. And the Fountain Blue has literally remained at the peak for decades. What makes the Fountain Blue so unique compared to its, you know, competitors in the area? Well, I'd say since we purchased it, it was always an iconic hotel. I mean, Morris Lafferty has built the Curvilinea building, and it's spectacular. And then there was a second building built, the Versailles. We purchased it about 15 years ago. We added two more towers. We doubled the size of it. But if I had to say in our ownership period, in the 15 years, it's all about an amazing experience. So if you're into food, if you're a foodie, you come here, we've got amazing restaurants from Scarpetta and Hakkasan, and we brought Michael Mina in with strip steak. So there's great, great dining experiences, both casual and fine dining. The restaurants, the clubs, you know, Live Night Club is spectacular. Uh, if you want that nightlife experience that Miami Beach is famous for, we certainly are at the very top of that pecking order. We also own Story Nightclub down on South Beach. Um, just the experience, you walk in and hang out at the blue bar and, you know, people watch. It's just such a great experience. And I think the best thing we can offer people is that when you go home, you talk about, wow, that pool experience was great, or the beach was great, the food was amazing. That night we stayed out all night at live, and you remember it for a really long time. That, to me, is a good return on their investment that they spend when they come to the Fountain Live. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with, 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 with the food experience. I mean, Hakkasan's is one of my favorites, so that's... That's a phenomenal restaurant. What would you say to anyone going into the hospitality business? What are the biggest pitfalls, right? People look at you, someone like you, and they're like, oh, well, he can do it, I can do it. And that they may not realize all the different pitfalls there are in that industry. What would you say are the, are the number one, two, and three pitfalls for someone entering? You know, I 
think that the general population thinks of hospitality of like restaurants because everybody eats at restaurants and rooms because they've all slept in a hotel room. But the reality is there's probably in any big resort like a Fountain Blue or any Vegas hotel, there's probably 50 different career paths. So if you're not really a people person, you want to look in the mirror and say, I should, uh, maybe I should be in reservation management. Maybe I should be in finance or accounting. Um, there's so many different career paths under the hospitality umbrella. When I speak at FIU, that's what I try and talk to the students about. Pick something you can really be passionate in. So when you say, like, what, what should they know? They should be able to get up in the morning and start their car and go in and be passionate about what they're about to do every day. And that way you don't have to go to work every day. You go to do something that you really love. Yeah, that that's exactly the way I feel. I, what would, you know, dovetailing off of that, what would you say is the number one piece of advice you would give someone trying to follow your shoes? Would it be that passion or is there something else that you would advise a youngster going into the hospitality business? I think you've got to be honest with yourself. You know, if you are a people person, you should get into hospitality. If you're not, then you need to get into something behind the scene. And there are, again, so many jobs, like the culinarians that I work with, they're unbelievably creative, but they're probably not the best people to be out front talking to our guests. That's where, you know, uh, a general manager or a, a concierge person that really could have great dialogue and great um, you know, intuition of what somebody wants. And a culinarian is making amazing food products. So you also got to be creative in our business, you know, to put out a beautiful plate that's got a little bit of everything on it. Um, and the people have a great experience again. They'll remember that and tell everybody else. Now, I guess the million dollar question is once you get to the top, which the Fountain Blue has been at the top, how do you avoid complacency, not only for yourself, but for your workers, right? It's very easy in any industry. Once you become the best at what you do, sit back on your laurels, rest, and then everyone else passes you. How have you avoided complacency with you and your staff? Well, I don't even know how to spell complacency. It's just not in our in, in our mindset. What we want to do is just go after it be passionate, strive to be the best. So if you're in a casual restaurant out at Lakota on the beach and, you know, the sun's shining and you're making great, crazy tropical drinks and you've got sports on the TV, that's all about the experience. So you can't be complacent. There are times to make changes. You know, not everything that you touch is going to be an instant success. So don't be afraid to make change and try something else. Yeah, that's that. That's, I think that goes for any industry. People, a lot of times, use the words, it's good enough. And I, I think it's, you're never good enough. Because the moment you say good enough, someone else is actually passing you. So I completely echo those statements. How do you, as COO, how do you constantly innovate and stay at the top of your game? Is there something that you're always looking for new ideas? Like, how does your, how does your brainstorming work on those? Well, I believe even to invite participation really helps you be innovative. So everybody on our team, whether it be our JW Marriott out my window here, you know, it's a, it's a really challenging resort. You've got a, a Tidal Cove water park. You've got two 18-hole golf courses. You've got restaurants like Bourbon Steak, maybe the best steakhouse in the state of Florida. So you hire people with tremendous experience. You need to utilize their experiences. And when something isn't going perfect, listen to them. Be creative. Make some changes. You know, for example, the water park. You know, we're about to change a slide there. We have seven different slides, and one really isn't a very popular one. So we're making an investment, and we're making a change there. So I believe in inviting everybody in to talk and tell us what their experiences were, what they're hearing from our guests, and then, you know, don't be afraid to make change. Do you think that, that companies within the hospitality industry should reinvent themselves in order to stay fresh and not get stagnant? You guys have done a great job of 
never having to reinvent yourself, just constantly innovating. But other organizations, do you feel like they may need to reinvent themselves when things become stagnant? Well, this may not be a popular answer, but the big companies, the big giant corporation, they're, they're very stuck in their ways. And, you know, the, I call them ASPs, Authorized Standard Procedures. You turn to page 311, I'll tell you how to run, um, you know, a coffee stand. Mm -hmm. And things change. So in, in corporations like ours, we're very, very quick to make changes and we're nimble. So if something's new in the coffee world and we're, we're now having cold brew and all these different type of things that you see in other companies do as you travel yourselves, you can make quick changes. But there are big companies that don't have to be named. We all know what they are. They, they're not as nimble and they're, they're stuck in their ways. Um, so that, that's why I really enjoy working for a private company even though there's brands like JW Marriott, we own Hilton's and other type products, but we're able to, we manage everything ourselves, whether it be retail stores within the hotels, whether it be the food, the beverage, the bars, the nightclub, we manage everything ourselves and we own everything. So we're absolutely able to move quickly. I can't emphasize that enough. I think you basically summarized your success right there innovative thoughts and being able to move quickly. The larger organizations don't innovate, they don't move quickly. And then that gives you the advantage because if there's something new, like you said, you can incorporate it quickly. So much really depends on the leader of the organization and you as COO, kind of give us an example of your leadership style. Are you hands on, hands off? You know, how do you, how do you lead that organization? I think the first part of that answer is attracting the right people. I mean, in any hotel, you have an executive team of maybe a dozen leaders in each discipline. So you got to attract the right people. They've got to then attract the right people. But my style is I don't like to micromanage. I hire great executives and then they hire great directors and great general managers in restaurants and and bars and, and the rooms division and let them do their job. And, you know, I don't mind, you know, adjusting here or there and say, hey, I would do this a little bit differently, but I don't think there's a need to micromanage at my level. Let them do a great job. They take great care of the guests and, and that takes care of our, our business model. Yeah, it's about hiring the right people. I think your job as a leader becomes a lot easier if you have the right people working for you. And I think that's that's an example of how you can delegate, but delegate intelligently in order to enhance the, the overall industry. Who would you say was your greatest role model during your career as you elevated to this level? You know, I, I had uh, worked for a gentleman by the name of Rick Kelleher. He's a, he was a chairman and CEO of Doubletree Hotels, and now he's got a company called Pyramid out of Boston. They probably have well over 100 hotels. And what he taught me was kind of what we're touching on, on the people and the style. When you hire the right people and take great care of them, I mean great care everywhere. If they're having a, a child, make sure you're you're happy for them and, and doing something about that. Or if they've got a problem, if there's a death in the family or a sickness, take great care of your people. And he did special things uh, for me as I try and do for my people. You take great care of them, they in turn owe us something, and that is to take great care of our guests. I mean, make it a special experience. If it's your three-year-old's little birthday out of title code, make sure something that they didn't order comes out. It could be a clown or a balloon or, or, so, or a little gift on the way out that they'll remember us. And as I said, that takes care of our business model and hospitality. We take great care of our people. They take great care of the guests and you're going to make money and you're going to be successful. Not everybody in these big corporations are close enough to that experience to make it happen where we are. I like being involved. I like going to the various properties, walking around and making sure that they believe in that philosophy. Now, I, I heard something that I thought was so amazing, and that is that you know the first names of all your employees that work there. Is that true? Well, I, I do my very best. You know, 
uh, our office director here, America, always makes fun of me because she'll make sure I know the ones that are brand new. And some of them have hard, you know, tougher names to remember, uh, but she's always holds my feet to the grindstone on that type of issue. That's very important. And not only know their name, but know if they've got kids or know if they're going through a tough time. So that all is taking great care of your people. That's such a great message for anyone who's in a leadership position. The more human you are, the more connected you are to the people who work underneath you, the harder they're going to work for you. So I think the fact that you take <clears throat> you take that ownership and you know the people that work for you, I guarantee those people work a thousand times harder. So yeah. kudos to you. And I think that's a great leadership style. You had mentioned earlier about COVID being so difficult. And I want to go back to that. COVID annihilated the vast majority of people in the hospitality business, restaurants, resorts. How did you not only get through COVID, but really come out on top and remain so successful? Well, you know, we're fortunate that we lived in a state that really took a very aggressive position on COVID. And uh, we at the Fountain Blue were the first luxury resort to open up in the nation. So I'll never forget on June 2nd, I got interviewed on NBC National News uh, saying, wow, you're the first one to open. So we were literally only closed for 90 days. We closed right after the Super Bowl. Uh, when I was like, what are these people wearing masks? What is this thing? And sure enough, boom, uh, it hit our country really hard. And unfortunately, lots of deaths. Uh, but we, in 90 days in June, we reopened. And I, I, I've got to say, we took it slow. But we, we reacted. We got our mojo back. We started rehiring. You know, I kept a very good core group of people in each asset. We just didn't look like shut down and let everybody go because you'd never find them again. Uh, but for the line level people, unfortunately, you know, for those 90 days, they weren't working. Uh, thank God the government took care of them. But um, we, we got our mojo back. We wanted that experience again. People were desperate to do something that stay home and, and, and hide from COVID. So when they came down, we had, you know, we checked that temperatures when they checked in, we gave them masks. We had we had little packages in the room so they could wipe down the TV remote and the telephone if they weren't sure that we did a good enough job. So we tried to make them feel comfortable and little by little it came back. But I have to say the city of Miami Beach and Miami-Dade County and even the state of Florida, you know, we took the high road. We wanted to get people back living again and enjoying life. Even if it's going out for dinner, we opened up as example, we opened up patios that weren't there before, and we started doing that. And if they wanted to eat outside instead of an in, inside environment, we put HEPA air filter, big giant things bigger than my desk in each restaurant. So when people came in, they said, wow, these people really give a darn, and we're cleaning the air as they're sitting there and eating. So it was not an easy time. Uh, as I said, one of the most difficult um, in my career, but uh, we, we all got through it. Yeah, got through it. And I'm sure that you're that you're better for it. You know, looking ahead, you know, Fountain Blue is already globally iconic. What are your future plans for the organization? Like, where do you go from here? There's one giant word we, we live by here. It's called growth. And uh, we are under construction right now, building an almost 4,000 room hotel in Las Vegas. Uh, will be the tallest tower, or we are the tallest tower, 67 stories at the end of Las Vegas Boulevard, wow. right north of Wynn Hotel. And uh, we'll, we'll be opening the middle of December. Uh, we're extraordinarily excited about it. We have over 20 restaurants. We're going to wow. bring facilities from Miami. We'll have Live Night Club and Live Day Club out there a giant arena for big shows. So that's really our focus right now is, is making sure that the experience we offer in Las Vegas is like none other. It should be an amazing, amazing hotel. And I'm, I couldn't be more excited about that. And then here more locally, uh, we've been working very hard in the last year and a half or so. We answered an RFP request for proposal and we expect to be building a hotel inside Miami International Airport. Wow. Probably 500 room 
Weston Airport Hotel. So I'm really excited about that to make uh, you know, our own hometown have a great hotel inside the airport. Unfortunately, right now, there's nothing like that. So uh, that, that's an exciting uh, opportunity for us in, in the growth area. And many others we're working on, but those are the two that really come to mind. I'm super excited about that Vegas hotel. I bet that's going to be off the hook with 20 restaurants. And yeah, yeah I'm going to have to check that out. You know, we're just, just wrapping up here, you've clearly been so successful. You've dominated the hospitality industry like no one else. What's your next life challenge? Um, <laughs> that, that's a harder question. You know, work comes easy to me. I love what I do. Probably in life is, uh, you know, I, I'm divorced and uh, I would like to uh, find a new person and enjoy life, have a partner, travel a lot, and enjoy the rest of the time I have on this earth to, to see things that I haven't seen yet. Well, amen, and kudos to everything that you and your team have done. Phil, I know you're super busy. A fantastic interview. Just amazing what you've done, because anyone can be successful, but can you be successful for the duration that you've done? I think that's what makes you and your team uh, so, so unique. And I think your leadership style, I echo that completely being passionate about what you do, loving what you do, leading by example, knowing your employees, caring about them. And I think that recipe, that's gonna be successful, whether it's hospitality, medicine, law, doesn't really matter. So I think great points that you, that you brought up and I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me on. And I invite all your listeners, come, come and experience some of our properties down here, whether it be down here or Las Vegas when it opens in December. We'll be open before the Super Bowl out there. Amazing. Can't wait. Thanks, Phil. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Take care, buddy.